the gifts of prophesying, speaking in tongues, healings, uh, all of these various movements to some degree or another are broadly denominated non-cessationist, or to put it positively, they're known as continuationist. What you see in the early church, what you see in the Gospels, what you see in the book of Acts, what we find the Spirit doing then and there, we should expect to see the Spirit doing here and now. Welcome, listeners. You're tuning into episode 128 of Mid America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable Podcast. This is a broadcast where the faculty of Mid America discuss Reformed theology and cultural issues, all from a Reformed perspective. I'm Jared Luchibor, Director of Marketing here at Mid America. And in today's episode, we kick off a new series with Dr. Cornelis Venema, President of Mid America and Professor of Doctrinal Studies and Dr. Marcus Minninger, Professor of New Testament Studies. They're going to address spiritual gifts in the church in the next few weeks. So we can think of speaking in tongues, prophecy, uh, and miraculous healing, for example, gifts that were commonplace in the age of the apostles. The question before us is whether those gifts continue to this day. In other words, this really is a debate in the church that's focused on cessationism versus continuationism of spiritual gifts. Take a listen. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Dr. Marcus Minninger. I'm Cornell Venema. We're going to be addressing together a pretty significant and much discussed and often a great deal of controversy regarding the question of the ongoing presence of the so-called gifts or charismata distributed by the Holy Spirit to the church. The context for the debate in the modern period, which usually centers on the question of whether all of the gifts, none of them accepted, that are represented, for example, in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, in the book of Acts, in the, the Gospels, and in other places in the New Testament epistles, all of the gifts of the Spirit, including word gifts or revelatory gifts, gifts of healing, gifts of speaking in tongues, closely associated with uh, the gift of prophecy, whether all of those gifts continue as an ordinary, regular feature of the life of the New Testament church, even to the present day, or have certain of these gifts for particular reasons, biblically, theologically, ceased to be present and to be given by the Spirit as an ordinary feature of the life of Christian believers, but even of the churches themselves. Now, before we get to the question directly, I think it's helpful to place the debate in the modern period, at least, within its historical context. It's a very complicated history, but certainly throughout the 20th century into the 21st, there has been in the modern church uh, a resurgence of interest in the uh, presence of the Spirit by way of these gifts in a way that distinguishes the modern period from uh, a good part of the history of the church, although you certainly have earlier chapters where, for example, in the early church in the development of the movement known as Montanism, there was an argument that the church was living in the latter days just prior to Christ's coming and that there would be a revival or a return to the church of gifts of prophecy, whereby the Spirit, a new revelation would be given by those empowered by the Spirit, gifted by the Spirit. But in the modern period, historians usually speak of historic Pentecostalism as a kind of first wave movement. It emerged early in the 20th century, came to expression in the formation of particular denominations, one of the most prominent and significant being the Assemblies of God. And what distinguished the first phase or wave of modern Pentecostal movements was the insistence that what was called variously baptism in or by the Holy Spirit as we read about that in the New Testament, the account of the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost and throughout the book of Acts, and as well by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, 
The first wave insisted that, and in this respect, it had some antecedents within various kinds of Christian perfectionist teaching, particularly in the Methodist tradition, where you have disciples of Jesus Christ, Christians who receive Christ, who are converted by the working of the Spirit through the Word, and who are justified, enjoy the grace of justification, and even perhaps in part sanctified, but who do not enter into a higher level form, a kind of second blessing, uh, enjoyment of the working of the Spirit in their sanctification. And you find something of an analog of that in early Pentecostalism, the first wave. The Assemblies of God, for example, teach that some believers, though not all, like the church as they waited for the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 1 and 2, not all believers enjoy that baptism, that fullness of the Spirit that comes when they're baptized by the Spirit. All Christians, of course, uh, receive baptism, the sacrament, and are baptized in water by means of the sign of baptism into the name of the triune God. But not all Christians enjoy that higher level, subsequent to conversion, filling baptism with the Spirit that all should seek to enjoy. They should do what the church did at Pentecost, tarry, wait, pray, anticipate, desire, and seek that special blessing of post-conversion baptism with the Holy Spirit, but not all receive it. And one of the distinguishing features of that particular expression of modern Pentecostalism was the insistence that the evidentiary mark, the sign that attests that you are a Spirit-baptized person or filled with the Spirit, is that you speak in tongues. And I'll not say much about the question of the phenomenon or the nature of the gift of tongue speaking at this point, but that was a, a particular claim that was often made and was certainly officially the uh, teaching of the Assembly of God Church. You know that a person is filled with the Spirit, has been baptized by the Spirit when they give evidence of the same by their uh, being gifted with the gift of speaking in tongues, whether that be tongues utilized in prayer They'll often refer to the first part of 1 Corinthians 14 in that connection, a so-called prayer tongue, or whether it be a speaking in tongues in the assembly, assemblies of God's people, where some would spontaneously, as the Spirit empowered them, uh, speak in an unknown tongue. Now, the second wave, if I may use the traditional language, taught a a very similar view, but it didn't come to expression in the formation of distinct Pentecostal denominations, so-called neo-Pentecostal, or broadly using the word rather generally, charismatic ecclesiastical traditions. I should back up a little bit and take note of the fact that consistent with the idea that this is a further unique second blessing endowment by spirit baptism, Uh, One of the pastoral and practical difficulties that that often confronted the church with was an attitude or a standpoint of, shall we say, viewing oneself as, in a more fulsome way, entering into the fullness of the Spirit's presence. There's a great book on the uh, history of Pentecostalism, in my estimation, by Frederick Dale Bruner, A Theology of the Holy Spirit. And he argues that, perhaps this is something of a psychological observation, what motivated and gave in some ways uh, strength and attractiveness to the movement, the first and second waves, was a kind of sense that ordinary Christians, if I may use that language, or the typical experience of believers in the modern evangelical church fell short of that call it fullness, that something more of what Brunner calls the tremendum of the Spirit's working and presence. Now, I want to go quickly to the third and perhaps most diffuse expressions of 
these modern waves of Pentecostal teaching that focus on the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit that accompany His presence when people experience the Spirit in greater measure. Uh, The third wave is more diffuse. It doesn't track exactly with the first and second waves of Pentecostal and Neo-Pentecostalism, especially in the teaching that baptism by or with the Spirit or enjoying the fullness of of the Spirit is in some sense a kind of second blessing that places you categorically in a company of those who belong to the church distinguished from others who have the Spirit in fullness. The third wave includes, for example, when I was a young pastor back in the 80s in Southern California, uh, a kingdom evangelist by the name of John Wimber started what was called the Signs and Wonders Movement. And his teaching was, was interesting in the sense that he didn't universalize or insist upon a distinct being baptized by the Spirit and speaking in tongues as evidence of enjoying that baptism. Uh, He used the language of kingdom evangelism and basically argued that when the gospel of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ comes and is ministered in a new people or cultural context, just as was true of our Lord's ministry and his proclamation of the coming near of the kingdom, at least in its initial commencement, just as his ministry in the ministry of the apostles and in the context of the early church's experiences that's recorded in the book of Acts, you uh, witness signs and wonders, it's sometimes referred to as the signs and wonders movement. So the inbreaking of the gospel of Christ's coming kingdom is in new people groups, often associated or accompanied by these kinds of signs and wonders miracles of healing, um, speaking in tongues, dramatic uh, displays of the transformative power of Christ's life-giving spirit. Now, in association with that, the third wave also includes a category of teaching. I'll just mention a couple of fairly prominent names, like the teaching of Wayne Grudem and even D.A. Carson, uh, noteworthy contemporary evangelical theologians, that um, though not all Christians, they reject this notion of a particular baptizing by the Spirit that is enjoyed only by some Christians and not by others, but they argued for a kind of cautious, what is often referred to as a cautious continuationism, that particularly gifts like the gift of prophecy, as you see that represented in the New Testament, or the gift of tongue speaking that is in close proximity to, that is a corollary of prophesying, speaking the Word of God by and in the power of the Spirit, a word authored by the Spirit and communicated through one who's gifted as a prophet. There is speaking in tongues, in some kind of unknown language, some other language unknown to the speaker, but perhaps known to the hearer or enabled to be known to the hearer when interpreted. Uh, they, they argued that prophesying or prophecy, tongue speaking, possibly other gifts in some measure, continue to be in, present in the modern church and should be recognized and acknowledged not as gifts that have ceased for any biblical theological war, reason, but gifts that continue. Uh, One of the interesting features of both Grudem and D.A. Carson's understanding of the continuation of the gift of prophecy is they argue that the kind of prophecy that we're talking about is not infallible, God-authored word of revelation that must be received without testing or judgment exercised on the part of the leadership of the church. And in that sense, it's a distinct gift. It shouldn't be equated with the gift of prophecy, for example, as we see that in the Old Testament epoch and period of redemptive history. It's a means whereby the Spirit, it's a little hard to capture the exact point here, but it it 
For example, they'll appeal to Paul's language at the end of 1 Corinthians 14, that in the judgment or examination of a word of prophecy spoken in the assembly of the church in Corinth, that was to be examined, and even in the passage that's interesting in its own right, but we'll gloss that question, uh, he forbids women to be engaged in the examination of prophecy. And the argument of Grudem, in particular, started with his dissertation, then published in his book on um, prophecy. He argues that that was untrue. That would not have been true in the ter- in terms of the Old Testament practice and gifts of a spirit-authored word through dream and vision by way of prophecy. That was a word coming directly to us from God as infallible truth. Our response to it is necessarily one of submission. We listen, we obey, we comply with the word that God has spoken through his servant, the prophet. But when Paul speaks of prophecy being uh, subject to critical examination and testing, that suggests that it's on the order of a kind of spirit-inspired word of wisdom, discernment, that can be of value to the church and individual members as well as particular members in a local congregation and ought to be received with appropriate respect. So just to sum up what I've stated is, though the exact position is quite diverse and there are different forms of affirming the continuation and the ongoing presence of all of the gifts of the Spirit, including most especially the three that are most discussed, the gifts of prophesying, speaking in tongues, healings, Uh, all all of these various movements to some degree or another are broadly denominated non-cessationist, or to put it positively, they're known as continuationist. What you see in the early church, what you see in the Gospels, what you see in the book of Acts, what you hear about in Paul's, uh, especially in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, what we find the Spirit doing then and there, we should expect to see the Spirit doing here and now. Uh, Not in the case of all believers, but certainly in the case of some who are peculiarly gifted by the Spirit to uh, minister those three gifts. At this point, I think I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Menninger, for any correction or additions that he wishes to make. Well, I thoroughly disagree, actually. (laughs) No. Uh, the um, you know, it's helpful to get the some of the positions set out in a historical way. I think that there are a lot of practical topics that get interwoven into all of this, and and some of those practical topics that you can see people wrestling with them, particularly perhaps when you get to the more uh, moderate views of of a Carson or Grudem, uh, that trying to deal with what could be some of, I think, clearly the the abuses of certain continuationist viewpoints. But you think about one of the things you mentioned, where is is the fullness of the Christian experience to be found and located? And what does that look like, right? What uh, certainly there is, there can be a, a sort of nominal or lacking Christian experience. So maybe that lacks in zeal for what the Lord has done or uh, that in, in some other way doesn't measure up to what the Lord would have for us. So what is that to look like? Um, I think that's an important question. And what does our unity consist in as a church? Because if you have many, many different people supposedly speaking the word of the Lord today on various occasions, etc., cetera, um, it can be a very fracturing thing for us. What is our authority? That's a huge question because... Are these continuing gifts, if they do exist in some modified form, are they authoritative? If they're not authoritative, on on par with Scripture, on par with the sorts of revelatory uh, events you see described in Scripture, then what? Then what really are they? Are they different than advice some other sanctified believer might give to you over the dinner table or in some other way? Right? Like, what's their standing? And then I think a, a big a big issue is uh, 
out of all of that, given, okay, what is our authority, then what is, what, what do we confess together, right? And where should our focus be? So those are, you know, I think questions that the continuationist versus cessationist uh, topic b- bears upon. The, in some ways, I think the question of where our focus should be sometimes captivates, uh, ca- captures a core issue here. The, the, the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movements, they, they can really come to eclipse scripture, uh, eclipse unity in the church and make quite unclear where we should be looking for authoritative, uh, guidance and teaching and doctrine. And, um, so people will sometimes ask the question, well, you know, I heard this or I experienced that or somebody I know experienced that or so forth. Like, let's, let's take maybe a lighter example. Could there be miracles today, right? Well, certainly God is able to perform miracles whenever and wherever he wants to. And, and uh, I have no doubt that he does uh, miraculously intervene, meaning uh, help us without the use of secondary causes at times, right? Somebody that recovers from cancer with no known medical explanation or the like, right? But that's a different question from where should we be focused as a church in applying ourselves to and expecting as the ordinary course of things by which God will faithfully build us up? Should we be, as the part of the ordinary course of things, expecting miraculous events? Or, while we pray for them with faith, should we be focusing on the pilgrimage of this life uh, through the means of grace, etc., in which God will build us up in, in maturity and so forth? And that should really be where we as a body are focused. I think sometimes that pastoral question, right? Am I missing something that God intends for his people that's a fuller experience of some sort that I'm being deprived of? Or do I have here in the uh, ministry of, let's say, our Reformed churches, a full provision upon which I can properly focus in order to experience what the Lord has for his people now and uh, be content with that. So that's just to set out some of, I think, kind of the existential questions that can come with these theological debates. Well, as you can pretty much guess at this point, our guests have taken a position on this matter. Stay tuned next week as they make the case for cessationism for more episodes you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcasts and wherever you listen to your favorite shows and be sure to search for and subscribe to mid-america reformed seminaries roundtable i'm jared luchabor till next time